Good evening and thanks for coming. So uh, the talk today is called The Doctor and the Saint. And I'm going to try and talk about a conflict between two men and through that conflict to try and look at colonialism, imperialism, race, and caste in a way that I think might complicate the way we usually understand it. The doctor is Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. I think perhaps a lot of you may not have heard of him. In India, certainly, he is a very, very beloved figure, particularly amongst the Dalits, the people who are formerly known as untouchables. Of course, untouchables not in the Hollywood sense, but in the opposite sense, you know, people right at the bottom of the caste ladder. And uh, the saint, the, it's a word that I use ironically in the title, and the saint is a person, I think, who is uh, beloved to many of you, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, sadly, some of the things that I will say today will, and I think should, call his greatness into question. And I know this is going to be distressing for many, and let me say it was distressing for me too, because I was also brought up, conditioned on this, um, well, what can I say, but misrepresentation of history, or even that is a, is a, is a polite word. Um, the conflict between them, uh, of course, began a long time ago, but it, it really came head to head in the 1930s, uh, at the time when India was still a, a British colony. But Ambedkar was really uh, Gandhi's nemesis. You know, he challenged him intellectually, he challenged him po politically, but he also challenged him morally. And the reason that he has been left out of the kind of master narrative of Indian history is because of this, you know. And uh, it's, not that he's, it's not that he's left out in the sense that he is somebody who obviously uh, children learn about in school. But he was a man who left a complicated legacy. He was a revolutionary. He was a newspaper editor. He uh, was a politician. And eventually, he actually uh, helped in the drafting of the Indian Constitution. But the way he is valorized in our history books, or in our lives generally, not among the Dalit people, but amongst the privileged castes, and by the state and the establishment, is as the leader of the establishment or the man who, who wrote, who, who kind of wrote the Indian Constitution. He didn't write it. He was the chairman of the drafting committee. And he was very unhappy with the Constitution when it came out. But in some way, they leave out the passion, the rage, and the anger that drove Dr. Ambedkar. And this was a fight against caste. So the annihilation of caste actually is the text of a speech that he never delivered. It was written in 1936, and he was invited by a sort of Hindu reformist privileged caste organization called the Jatpat Torak Mandal, which means the, an organization for the destruction of caste, or for the breakup of caste, let's say. And he uh, gave in this text in advance, because he asked him to. And when they read it, and they realized that he was going to use their platform to denounce the sacred texts of Hinduism and to call upon untouchables, as they were called in those days, to, to, to renounce Hinduism and, and embrace any other religion that does not discriminate against human beings in this way, uh, they canceled, the invitation to him was canceled. So then he published The Annihilation of Caste as a text. And um, the man who we know as the greatest Hindu of all time, Mahatma Gandhi responded, and Ambedkar responded to that response. And, and that, that is, the, is the main text of this book. Annihilation of caste as a text has been available. It's a kind of underground legend, 
and yet very few people in the establishment read it because it isn't available. It is the Dalits who have, have kept it in print. But this is the first time that it's been extensively annotated so that you can see the reference that, you know, many times he makes references to incidents which then people would have known about, but today people don't know what it's about. So it's an extensively annotated edition. And of course, my introduction to it is called The Doctor and the Saint. It's, a, it's an almost book length introduction. Um, of course, many have said, you know, you should have published as it as a separate book. Uh, if it had been published as a separate book in India, I'm pretty sure it would have been banned or disappeared in some way. So it, it was a bit of a Trojan horse operation. So now, before I, I, I you know, get into the whole debate between these, these, these two streams of thought, I just want to read out a little bit for those of you who, you know, caste is, is something that uh, the outside world has, 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 has felt nervous of engaging with because it's just associated with Gandhi and yoga and backpacks and mysticism and the Beatles and so on. So I want to explain to those of you who, who are not aware of what caste is. I'm just going to read out a little bit. Anthropologists will debate the origins of caste for years to come but its organizing principles based on a hierarchical sliding scale of entitlements and duties of purity and pollution and in the ways in which they were and still are policed and enforced are not all that hard to understand. The people at the top of the caste pyramid, the Brahmins, are considered pure and have plenty of entitlements. And those at the bottom are considered pollu polluted and have few entitlements but plenty of duties. And the pollution purity matrix is correlated to an elaborate system of caste-based ancestral occupation. So there, isn't, there isn't any single caste that is equal to another caste. It's a, a very clear hierarchy, however complicated it is, a very clear hierarchy. What we call the caste system today is known in Hinduism's founding text as Varnashram Dharma or Chaturvarna, the system of four Varnas, approximately 4,000 endogamous castes and sub-castes, which are called jatis, in Hindu society, each with its own specified hereditary occupation, are divided into four Varnas. The Brahmins, who are the priests, who are about 6% of the population, the Kshatriyas, the warriors, the Vaishya, the Baniyas, as they are called, who are the traders, who are less than 3%, and this is the caste to which Gandhi belonged. And the Shudras, who are the, serv the servants. And outside of these Varnas are the Ati Shudras, the subhumans, arranged in hierarchies of their own, the untouchables, the unseeables, the unapproachables, whose presence, whose touch, whose very shadow is considered polluting by privileged caste Hindus. Today, may, I mean, just amongst these untouchable castes, there could be like a hundred or more than a hundred sub-castes, and even they are arranged in a hierarchy. And today, about 100 million people, which is one-third of the population of the United States, counts as untouchable. Each region of India has lovingly perfected its own unique version of caste-based cruelty based on an unwritten code that's much worse. Much worse, I say, not because I want to compare horrors, but the only reason I'm saying worse than racism is because it's sanctioned in the scriptures. It is said to have religious sanction, you know, which is such, a, uh, you know, such an immutable thing in some ways. Other than being forced to live in segregated settlements, Untouchables were not allowed to use the public roads that privileged castes used. They were not allowed to drink from common wells. They were not allowed into Hindu temples. They were not allowed into privileged caste schools. They were not permitted to cover their upper bodies. They were only allowed to wear certain kinds of clothes and certain kinds of jewelry. Some castes, like the Mahars, the caste to which Baba Sahab Ambedkar belonged, had to tie brooms to their waist that would sweep away their polluting footprints, and others had to hang spittoons around their necks to 
collect polluted saliva. Men of the privileged caste had undisputed rights over the bodies of untouchable women. Love is polluting, but rape is pure. In many parts of India, all this continues to this day. What remains to be said about an imagination, human or divine, that has thought up an arrangement such as this? Ambedkar called Hinduism a chamber of horrors. For the untouchables, he said, it's a chamber of horrors. And here I quote him. He says, there cannot be a more degrading system of social organization than the caste system. It is a system that deadens, paralyzes, and cripples people from helpful activity. The most famous Indian in the world, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, disagreed. He believed that caste represented the genius of Indian society. In 1921, in his Gujarati journal Navajivan, he wrote, and I quote, I believe that if Hindu society has been able to stand, it is because it is founded on the caste system. To destroy caste and adopt the Western European social system means Hindus must give up the principle of hereditary occupation, which is the soul of caste. So by this he means that the caste that should, whose divinely ordained operation is to clean other people's shit should continue to do that. The Brahmin should remain the Brahmin, and so on. Hereditary principle is an eternal principle. I continue to quote Gandhi. To change it is to create disorder. I have no use for a Brahmin if I cannot call him a Brahmin for my life. It will be chaos if every day a Brahmin is changed into a Shudra, and a Shudra is changed into a Brahmin. Now, of course, uh, the contention is that Gandhi changed his mind later on. He didn't, really. Right to the end of his days, he believed in Varnashram Dharma. He said, OK, maybe the many castes should be fused into the four Varnas. Now, why is it that people in the world, I mean, I guess the most people in the world know about Gandhi through Richard Attenborough's film, which was really a, a terrible distortion of history, in which uh, Ambedkar didn't even have a walk-on part, you know? And, and the reason that people associate Gandhi as a person who was a warrior against caste was because, like many Hindu reformers, and I've come to this in a while, he campaigned against untouchability, which was the performative end of caste. You know, but actually, caste is about entitlement. Caste is about your access to resources. Caste is about your right to study. Caste is about your access to water and land. These things Gandhi never questioned. But in order to maintain the status quo, you know, he, he, he began to campaign against untouchability as being wrong. And I'll get into this in a while. So other contemporary abominations like apartheid, racism, sexism, economic imperialism, and religious fundamentalism have been politically and intellectually challenged at international forums. Of course, they have not been defeated. And of course, racism and apartheid and all these things continue to exist in newer and slyer ways. But how is it that the practice of caste in India, this most brutal mode of hi hierarchical social organization that human society has known, has managed to escape scrutiny? And how is it that one of its most ardent supporters has come to be seen as the saint of the modern world, a sort of modern day Christ? Perhaps because caste is associated with mysticism and yoga and vegetarianism, and also because unlike racism and apartheid caste is not color coded and isn't easy to see. So even today you have you have Indian intellectuals who support caste and say, you know, this is the glue that holds Indian society together. Caste is not the same as race, but casteism and racism are both forms of discrimination that target people because of their descent. To support caste is very much like supporting racism or apartheid. Another reason that caste has passed underneath the radar of international scrutiny <clears throat> is because by force-fitting caste into a sort of reductive Marxist class analysis, many progressive Indian intellectuals
intellectuals, and there are many who are very, very well known. And for them, caste is just a footnote. You know, it isn't addressed as the engine that drives Indian society. It, it, it doesn't, they have not managed to develop the tools to explain caste. And, and, and sometimes that erasure is a political act, you know, that, 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 that kind of um, what I call the project of unseeing. And sometimes it just comes from a place of such privilege that the people just assume that, they, that it doesn't exist because they only exist amongst the elite and they haven't stumbled on caste, not even in the dark. So you can have books written about identity and justice and reason and not even mention caste, development, all of this. Now, I, I don't want to kind of, uh, you know, rain down statistics on your head, but I'll just give you a thumbnail sketch of how caste, uh, you know, global capital, people argue that global capital and this kind of free market loving democracy that India has, has broken down old networks and created new systems and hierarchies that have broken caste. But in fact, if you look at it, the opposite is true, that this new free market democracy has entrenched and modernized caste. I mean, I can tell you from every angle how that has happened. It's all in the book, but I'll just give you a brief example. For example, the whole world knew when the big protests happened in 2012 on the Delhi gang rape and murder. But you would be shouted down on an Indian television channel if you mentioned that that same year, 1,500 Dalit women were raped by upper caste men, by, by privileged caste men. And that's just about 10% of what actually happens because these rapes are not recorded. In 2012, 651 Dalits were killed in caste murders. If you look at who owns land, I'd say 90% of Dalits are landless. You, the statistics are all there, you know? If you look at uh, almost any, any indicator of social justice, you see what's going on. But of course, academics and journalists and all of us, we, we do love NGOs, you know, everybody loves to study the poor, very few like to study the rich. But if you look at what has happened in India recently, I mean, because of globalization, uh, as we know, something like 800 million Indians live on less than half a dollar a day. And yet you have 100 people, just like in the United States, you have the 1%. 99% thing, but you look at that 1% and you see, if you look at who the, who the billionaires in India are, they are almost all Banias who belong to that trader caste, Gandhi's caste, you know, their names are all down here. If you look at the corporations, they're all family owned, again owned by Banias. And they now, these few corporations, they own mines, they own petrochemicals, they own uh, electricity distribution, they own ports, they own special economic zones, they own um, water, dams, uh, you know, publishing houses, universities. The, the, the spectrum of what they own is incredible. And then they own, like for example, Reliance, the biggest corporation in India, it owns 27 fully 24-hour news channels. So they own the media, they own all these businesses. You know, there's this kind of full spectrum dominance. Banias are also the small shopkeepers, they're also the rural money lenders, and most of rural India is in the clutches of incredible debt. So the small percentage of the population controls the economy. Then if you look at who is who is, which are the predominant castes in the judiciary? Who are the editors? Who are the big journalists? It's again Banias and Brahmins. So you have a, 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 you know, you, you have the situation where caste and capitalism have merged into this kind of deadly alloy. And, and even as you know, parties that represent the lower castes rise, the real power has shifted into the hands of the corporations which are controlled by these people. So this is the 
this is the reason why, you know, speaking of this old conflict is so important. So as I said, in 1936 was the year when, when uh, Ambedkar published The Annihilation of Caste. When he, it was I think in 1935 that he first called on the untouchable population, which was about 44 million people at that time, to, to give up Hinduism and to embrace any other religion. And this, at that moment, came as a, as a terrible, terrible, terribly dangerous sign to what were the Hindu reformers. And I'll explain why. You know, until the turn of the century, there wasn't such a thing, such an idea as Hindu. People who today are called Hindus or who call themselves Hindus never did call themselves Hindus. They only refer to themselves as their caste. You know, they would say, I'm a Brahmin, I'm a Jadhav, I'm a Gujar. You know, everybody just identified themselves according to their caste name. And earlier on, during the Mughal reign, millions of untouchables had converted to Islam, later to Christianity, and later to Sikhism to, ex uh, to escape the scourge of caste. And nobody had a problem with that. But at the turn of the century, suddenly the politics of empire began to turn into the politics of the nation state. And suddenly, you know, it was not enough to just ride your horse or your elephant into Delhi and take the throne and, and declare yourself the emperor. So with the nation state came the politics of representation. And here was a subcontinent where there were Sikhs and Christians and Jains and Buddhists and you know Brahmins and Vaishyas, people with so many religions, 3,000 languages. All of this was kind of now being synthetically homogenized into a nation state. And at that time, the politics of representation began. You know, who has the right to say, I represent everybody? You know, who represents the big farmers, who rep represents the labor, who represents the Sikhs, who can say who represents whom. And at this point, suddenly the idea that 44 million people under the accounting head of Hindu might just move over onto another side created a tremendous anxiety. And this was when these sort of uh, privileged caste Hindu reform organizations suddenly came into being, you know, uh, the Arya Samaj, the Brahmo Samaj, the Ramakrishna Mission, and they started proselytizing amongst untouchables, and they started speaking against untouchability, but not against caste, so, because the whole thing was to bring these, this huge population into the Hindu fold, but to keep them somehow to keep them in the servants' quarters. So you had this privileged caste reform movement, and you had an anti-caste movement to the tradition to which Ambedkar belonged, which started off with Buddhism, you know, when Buddhism broke caste thousands of years ago. So you had Ambedkar came from a long line, and his contemporaries were, I mean, I won't get into it here, but people like Jyoti, Jyoti Vapule and Periyar and Ayoti Das, who were speaking against caste. And Gandhi came from the tradition of people who were speaking against untouchability, trying to, trying to bring them into the big fold. So that is why he had this, this really strange, performative, theatrical approach to reform. So when I, when I, basically when I started reading, when I read the debate between uh, Gandhi and Ambedkar in The Annihilation of Caste, I, I kind of started following this thread back of, you know, these things that Gandhi was saying about caste, just, it just shocked me, you know, and I, I mean, I've been, I've been brought up with the same kind of history textbooks about how he was in South Africa and he was thrown out of the train and, he was so roused to you know, he fought race. And I started following this thread back, saying how could a man who was saying the things he was saying in 1936, in 1925, how, how did this man come to be called a Mahatma? Who called, 
him a Mahatma? When was he called a Mahatma? And I, I, I find that he, he um, was first called a Mahatma in 1915, which was the year he came back after spending 20 years of political activism in South Africa. So then I thought, now what has he done in South Africa that, uh, that made him a Mahatma there? And that became even more shocking than, than, than anything else, you know, because he arrived, Gandhi arrived in South Africa in 1980, sorry, in 1894, and he arrived there as a lawyer, as a legal advisor to a rich uh, Muslim businessman, Indian Muslim businessman. And at the time, Britain was kind of strengthening its imperial grip on Africa. They discovered diamonds and they had discovered all these minerals. And there were two kinds of Indians in South Africa at the time. There were the passenger Indians who were the sort of privileged caste Indians who had gone to South Africa to trade, to run their businesses on the back of British imperialism. And then there were the indentured labor, the poor subordinated caste bonded laborers who had been brought to work the sugar, found, uh, sugar plantations. So Gandhi's first political awakening uh, when he was uh, on this train in this whites only compartment and he was thrown out in Peter Maritzburg was not because he, belie he, 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 he believed in racial equality but because, and he's written this, you know, I mean I would not presume to say any of this all my research comes straight from the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. Everything I say is quoted directly from his own writings. So he actually was outraged that passenger Indians should be treated on par with what he called the raw kafir. He only referred to Africans as kafirs or savages. And I'll read out what he said, but, but his first political victory was in 1894 uh, when, he when he lobbied and won a solution, what was known as the solution to the problem of the Durban post office, where he had the authorities open a third entrance for Indians so that they would not have to share the same entrance as Africans. So that was the first victory. Then he started the Natal Indian Congress, to which the membership fee was three pounds. Many, many years later, in the Bambata uprising, the Zulu uprising, they rose up against the British because of a three pound tax. So you can imagine how exclusive this Natal Indian Congress was. And then in 1899, you know, Gandhi keeps writing about how he's looking forward to an Indo to an imperial brotherhood with the British and how the passenger Indians are of Indo-Aryan Indo stock, the same Aryan stock as the British. And then in 1899, when the British go to war in the savage war against the Boers, Gandhi sides volunteers and sides with them. Of course, they don't give him arms, so he uh, is a stretcher bearer and I think quite Soon you will read a book called The Stretcher Bearer of Empire that's coming out written by a South African academic. Um, so he joins the British in the Boer War. Then in 1906 he joins, uh, oh let me just read you what Gandhi said about indentured bonded, Indian bonded labor. They are apt to yield to the slightest temptation to tell a lie and after some time Lying with them becomes a habit and a disease. They would lie without any reason, without any prospect of bettering themselves materially, indeed without knowing what they are doing, they reach a stage in life when their moral faculties have completely collapsed. Now, this theme repeats itself. I've quoted Gandhi from 1894 to 1946, right to the end of his life. So the business of his changing, the business of, oh, he was a man of his times, is addressed in this work because, you know, you can either be a man of your times or you can be a Mahatma, you really can't be both. Then in uh, 1906, the Zulu chief, Bambata uh, Kamachinza, led his people in an uprising against the British. 
and, and Gandhi volunteers his services. He asks to be armed with weapons, but the British turn him down. And eventually, it was a massacre. Uh, the chief, uh, Bambata, was beheaded. Thousands of Zulus were killed. Even Churchill, you know, the master of war, was shocked and wrote these letters saying, you know, how can we be so brutal? But Gandhi continued to press his friendship on the British. And then in 1906, the British, despite these offers of friendship, passed an act which said, which disallowed the passenger Indians from going into the Transvaal to compete with British businessmen. So that was, a, that was the time when Gandhi started developing the, the methods of Satyagraha. Now, the thing is that, you know, I don't think we should, we should just uh, look at all of this as saying, oh, are you trying to say that Satyagraha is a bad thing? No, I'm not trying to say that. But I'm just trying to tell you the, the, co the, the context in which this kind of politics arose. So, um, you know, he had by then been given a huge farm by, by a German friend of his called Kallenbach. It was like a thousand acre fruit farm on which he started this ashram. And he started experimenting with, uh, you know, with the rituals of poverty and pure, it was very much based in caste, you know, purity and pollution. He, in, you know, he, he kept talking about how a satyagrahi has to be pure, he has to be vegetarian, he mustn't have sex, and all this kind of stuff started there. And uh, he was thrown into prison. And this time, the man who couldn't bear to enter a post office door, uh, share a post office entrance with an African, had to now share a prison cell. And there's a series of letters he writes about this. He begins a campaign saying that in Indians and Africans must have se separate cells, separate food, separate bathrooms. And here just one, one of these many letters. We were all prepared for hardships, but not quite for this experience. We could understand not being classed with the whites, but to be placed on the same level with the natives seemed to be too much to put up with. I then felt that Indians had not launched our passive resistance too soon. Here was further proof that the obnoxious law was meant to emasculate Indians. Apart from whether or not this implies degradation, I must say it's rather dangerous Kafirs, as a rule, are uncivilized. The convicts even more so. They are troublesome and very dirty and live almost like animals. So this, this kind of thing goes on. And then these rituals of poverty start to be developed in, in, in the Tolstoy farm. And the question is, you know, when you're, when you're enacting poverty, there is, I, according to me, I mean, poverty is not just about having no money, right? Poverty is about having no power. And here was a person who was accumulating power, but performing the rituals of poverty. So while Gandhi was taking off his suit and putting on the loincloth, Ambedkar, a man who was born in an untouchable family, who was not allowed to wear clothes, was putting on a suit. Which was the more radical act, you know, is a question we have to ask ourselves. Um, but it was only in 1913, which was his last year in South Africa, that Gandhi actually stepped out from this privileged, uh, you know, agitation. I mean, you're, you're performing the rituals of poverty. You're developing satyagraha. What are you fighting for? Not, to, not for the indentured worker, not for the colonized African, not for higher wages, not for justice, but for the right of the Indian businessman to expand his business into the Transvaal. You know, it's a real irony. And it's only in 1913, his last year in South Africa, that actually Gandhi stepped out to join the worker strikes, the coal worker strikes, the Indian indentured labor strike. But very quickly, he signs a deal with Jan Smuts and leaves South Africa that very year, the year of blood. South African Year of Blood, it was called. And, and it is around that time that Gandhi's sort of semi-commissioned biographies begin to be written. 
and all of them are written by Christian missionaries. All of them start calling him the living Christ, the, the savior of the poor, and so on, when actually it was just the opposite, you know? So you all, you all remember Reverend Charlie Andrews from the Attenborough film? He, he came to South Africa and fell on his knees and, 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 and said that Gandhi was the living avatar of Christ. Uh, in 1921, the Unitarian minister John Haynes Holmes of the Community Church in New York, in a sermon called, Who is the Greatest Man in the World, introduced Gandhi to his congregation as the suffering Christ of the 20th century. And in much later, in 1958, Martin Luther King Jr. said, Christ furnished the spirit and motivation while Gandhi furnished the method. And they actually presented Gandhi with a constituency of African Americans, a great irony because he, he had great contempt for Africans. And Martin Luther King actually, in, in a sense, was more Gandhian than Gandhi. I mean, he led a sanitation workers strike, but Gandhi said for sweepers to go on strike was a sin, you know? So it, it's, it, it, and anyway, he, he leaves South Africa in 1913, goes to England, where he's given the highest civilian award of Imperial Britain, the Kaiser A. Hind. And then he arrives in India, somewhere on the high seas, the wind bestows him the title of the Mahatma, who, who fought racism and who fought for justice and who fought for equality. And he arrives on the shores of India as a Mahatma. And who greets him? The biggest industrialists in India, the Birlas, the biggest mill owners, they greet him, they take him from city to city, they embrace him, they fund his ashram, and there, there was born the first, perhaps the greatest, perhaps never to be repeated, the greatest corporate funded NGO the world has known. That was where it began, and Gandhi, the, the, at that time when he arrives, the mill owners are all on, the mill owners have made money during the war, but the mill workers are on strike. There are these lightning strikes happening. And the mill owners call Gandhi in to negotiate with the workers. And he starts, a not a union, it's an association. And, and the first condition is that they will not represent themselves. He will represent them. Gandhi will represent them. And this is, this is the man who Ambedkar, who at the time Gandhi was coming to India, Ambedkar was actually leaving for Colombia. He studied in Colombia. He got a scholarship to study in Colombia. And this is the man that, that, that he presumed to argue with. So Ambedkar, of course, did not have to go all the way to South Africa to experience injustice. As I said, he was born in a Mahar family. And, and because of British legislation, an untouchable boy was allowed to attend a touchable school. But this man, this, this greatest, I think, one of the greatest Indian intellectuals, was made to sit on a gunny sack in the corner of the classroom so that he would not pollute the other privileged caste children. Then his family moves to Bombay, and he gets a scholarship, finally graduates. He gets a scholarship by the Maharaja of Baroda to come to Colombia, where he studies, and writes this brilliant paper about caste. He's 25 years old, and then comes back to India, to Baroda. Around the same time, you know, Gandhi's star is rising, and Ambedkar, to work off his scholarship, has to go to Baroda to work. And, and, and the boy who studies in Colombia, who sits at table with everyone else, who studies in the library, who you know, eats at the dining table, now goes to office and the clerks are throwing files at him. They're rolling up the carpet so his feet won't pollute the carpet in, in the office. He cannot find a place to live. He cannot, ni neither Hindus, nor Muslims, nor Christians, nor Parsis will allow an untouchable into their house. So eventually, he moves back to Bombay. And at this time is when this whole business of bringing the untouchables into the Hindu fold is at its peak. And Ambedkar sees right through this charade. You know, he sees 
that it's all a way of manipulating the privileged class, ma manipulating to control and represent this huge constituency. So he begins to, 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 to first he starts news, newspapers. He was the editor of several newspapers. And most important, he starts thinking, he, he has studied law, he's an economist, he's a philosopher, and he starts developing legally uh, uh, and politically a way of trying to, to, to lobby for the untouchable people to represent themselves. You see, because if you look at the way populations are scattered, they're always on the edges of villages and so on. So they can never form a political constituency. They're always the minority. So he's developing a way, trying to think of a way of how they could become a political constituency. And this is what Gandhi and the other privileged caste re reformers just don't want. And this is what Gandhi stakes his life on to destroy. And it is this battle of political representation that is at the core of the conflict between Gandhi and Ambedkar. So, you know, as, as t I don't have time to get into everything, but you, you all have heard of the Salt Satyagraha. Of course, it was a fantastic, imaginative political campaign by Gandhi in 1930 when he called upon the people of India to march to the sea and make salt to break the British salt tax. That was in 1930. In 1927, Ambedkar read, led a satyagraha, which not just you, but most Indians have never heard of. It was called the Mahat Satyagraha, when he, when tens of thousands of Dalits gathered in the small village, the town of Mahad in, in, in what is now Maharashtra. And they marched through the town to insist that Dalits should be allowed to drink water from a public tank, which they were disallowed from, but which some British legislation had actually made legal, but people were too scared to actually test it out. So they did the Mahat Satyagraha in 1927. There were two, one and then another, but I'm, I'm just going to collate them. So they marched through the town. They drank water. The Brahmins purified the tra tank by pouring cow dung into it, you know? And what did Gandhi do? Gandhi did not support the Mahat Satyagraha. That same year, speaking in Lahore at a meeting, he said, you know, untouchables should try to get their way by sweet persuasion. Because when they do Satyagraha, it actually amounts to Duragraha, which he divined as a devilish force. You know? So between salt and water, there was a toxic universe of politics in India. Now, uh, in 1930 was the, f uh, you know, the first round table conference where the British had, the British government called this conference in order to kind of devise a constitution for home rule. So you had Muslim representatives, Sikh representatives, Christian representatives, and for the first time, the untouchables, uh, you know, represented by Dr. Ambedkar went to London. The, the Congress party, which was a party really run by pr privileged caste Hindus, Brahmins and Banyas, they were boycotting it because that was the time of the Sol Satyagraha. And that was when Ambedkar developed this really brilliant um, proposal for the double vote. You know, so he said that untouchable people should be allowed to, to vote for their own representative, and then they should be given another vote to vote for a general representative for a period of 10 years until they can develop themselves into a constituency. And the British and everyone else there accepted that. But of course, the round table conference uh, ended. And then there was a second round table conference in 1931, when Gandhi was nominated by the Congress to go and uh, represent them. And it was at that conference that Ambedkar and Gandhi had their first confrontation. And before the uh, official confrontation, Gandhi met Ambedkar, and he just looked at this really erudite, sharp young man and assumed he was a Brahmin. 
and uh, uh, you know what, whatever, a self-hating Brahmin. And he said, he, 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 he questioned him about Ambedkar's already vociferous critique of the Congress party, which according to Gandhi m amounted to a critique of the homeland. And, and there's this poignant moment when Ambedkar looked at him and said, Gandhiji, I have no homeland. No untouchable worth his name would think of this as his homeland. And then at the conference, which went on for several weeks, this confrontation began, where Gandhi said, I in myself, in my own person, represent India's 44 million untouchables. And he refused to acknowledge that Ambedkar could have a voice or could, you know, could, could ask for this separate constituency. He was all right. Gandhi agreed about the Muslims, Christian Sikhs. That was OK. But no, the untouchables will not have a separate constituency. He said, I would rather Hinduism die than untouchability survive, which was, again, fancy footwork. You know, like, I, I want to read to you a part about uh, about about caste and entitlement, which I think will have a resonance here. See, because what what was what was the caste system? You know, how how was caste maintained? How can a system of such immutable hierarchy be maintained? How do landlords force laborers, generation after generation, to toil night and day on subsistence wages? Why would an untouchable laborer, who is not allowed to even dream of being a landowner one day, put his or her life at the landlord's disposal to plow the land, to sow seed, and harvest crop, if it were not out of the sheer terror of the punishment that awaits the wayward? How were African slaves forced to work on American cotton fields? By being lynched and hung from trees for others to see and be afraid. Why are the murders of insubordinate Dalits even today never simply murders but ritual slaughter? Why are they always burnt alive, raped, dismembered, and paraded naked? Because casteism, like racism, and, and this is true of racism today in America, it can only be maintained with the continuous threat of and the regular application of egregious violence. So the question is, what does it mean for a doctrine of nonviolence to be founded on a base of egregious violence? What kind of nonviolence is that, is the question. And, and, and at the roundtable conference, Gandhi just said, you, you, you cannot represent yourself. And then he threatened them. He said, look, I will give up my life for this, but this can't happen. And he just took the boat back to India. On the way, he stopped by, dropped in on Mussolini, went back and wrote about what a nice man he was. <laughs> no, I'm serious. He did. And then, um, so, so here, here uh, you know, sorry to go back a bit in time, but so, so you have this hardening of this idea of the Hindu. As I said earlier, you know, there wasn't any such thing as a Hindu. There were just these various castes and subcastes, and suddenly when people started calling themselves Hindu, it wasn't actually referring to their religion. It was the creation of a political constituency. So they're always talking about the Hindu nation or the Hindu race. And, and, and around 1925 came the RSS, the Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh, which later on became overtly fascist which said that it, and today says that the Muslims of India are like the Jews of Germany. Hitler is in their pantheon. Our prime minister today is a member of the RSS, as so are all his ministers. So that school of Hindu fascism had already arrived. And Ambedkar, you know, he, he just considered them outside the pale. So his argument was, was directed at the Hindu liberal, people like Gandhi. And he said that it's not possible to believe in the Shastras and call yourself a moderate at the same time. It's a contradiction in terms. So, so, so these are the two men now confronting each other. And Gandhi returns to India. 
And the British announced the communal award, which is known as the communal award, where they do allow the untouchables a separate electorate for 20 years so that they can develop into what Ambedkar wanted. And Gandhi's response was to go on an indefinite hunger strike. You know, he never went on any hunger strike on any issue about untouchability except this one, to destroy the possibility of untouchable folks representing themselves. And when he announced this indefinite hunger strike from prison, there was obviously the country went into a spin and all the great leaders descended on Ambedkar and including many other untouchable leaders who grew very frightened because if Gandhi died on that hunger strike, you know, the untouchable community was going to be lynched. So there was an incredible amount of pressure and uh, it, it, was, it, it was really, it was really a, a terrible moment for, for Ambedkar and he had to back down in the face of that pressure. He had to back down and he signed what, uh, he agreed to sign what is known as the Pune Pact. Of course, in the round table conference, Gandhi refused to say, uh, admit that he was a leader of the untouchables, but in the Pune Pact, he allowed, <laughs> he said Ambedkar will sign as the representative of the untouchables. And Gandhi himself didn't sign it, but various industrialists and Hindu right-wing people signed it. And in the Pune Pact, what happened was, instead of having a separate constituency, they said that they would have reserved seats for untouchables, but that meant that those who stood for elections would be approved by the privileged caste. So they had to be well-behaved people, you know, the, uh, the, the house niggers, as uh, uh, Malcolm X would have called them. So this was the situation in 1932. And Ambedkar just, uh, and, and as soon as the Pune Pact was signed, uh, if, you, if you look at the Attenborough film, you see, you know, it was, it, 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 the world rejoiced as if caste had been broken, when in fact what had happened was that the possibility of untouchables in India developing into a constituency had been broken. And um, Gandhi then embarked on, uh, on, on, a, uh, on various sort of reformist measures, because you know, what he did and what many of the reformers did was to reduce the whole question of entitlement and caste to the issue of untouchability. Then Gandhi reduced it further to the issue of bhangis. Bhangis is what he used to call scavengers, and they are called um, Valmikis today. And Gandhi just used them as a sort of show window uh, on, on which he just performed his amazing acts of, uh, you know, missionary goodness. And in, 19, in 1936, when Ambedkar wrote uh, The Annihilation of Caste, which, is, which I hope you will all read, it's a really brilliant, erudite document. Gandhi wrote an essay, which I have to read to you, it'll take me two minutes. It was called The Ideal Bhangi. And he says, the Brahmin's duty is to look after the sanitation of the soul. The Bhangi is that of the body of society. And yet, our woebegone Indian society has branded the bhangi as a social pariah and set him down at the bottom of the scale. If only we had given him due recognition, if we only had given due recognition to the status of the bhangi as equal to the Brahmin, our villages would have looked a pic picture of cleanliness and order. I therefore make bold to state without any manner of hesitation or doubt that not till the invidious distinction between Brahmin and Bhangi is removed will our society enjoy health and prosperity. Then he goes on to outline the educational requirements and practical skills and etiquette of an ideal Bhangi. What qualities, I quote, what qualities therefore sh should such an honored servant of society exemplify in his person? In my opinion, an ideal Bhangi should have a thorough knowledge of the principles of sanitation. He should know how a right kind of latrine is constructed and the correct way of cleaning it. He should know how to overcome and destroy the odor of excreta and various disinfectants to render them innocuous. 
He should likewise know the process of converting urine and night soil into manure. But that's not all. My ideal bhangi would know the quality of night soil and urine and would keep a close watch on those and give timely warning to the individual concerned. Now, um, a, an ancient text called the Manusmriti says, you know, that shudras uh, should not amass wealth. So uh, Gandhi, in his ideal bhangi, says, but such an ideal bhangi, while deriving his livelihood from his occupation, would approach it only as a sacred duty and would not dream of amassing wealth out of it. Now, 70 years later, in his book, Karma Yogi, Narendra Modi, the new Prime Minister of India, proved he was a diligent disciple of the Mahatma. You know, all Modi's pronouncements were, when he was the Chief Minister of Gujarat, were delivered from the Mahatma Mandir. And, you know, while the left often thinks of Gandhi as a bulwark between the right, Hindu right, and moderation, actually, particularly on the issue of caste, Gandhi was the Hindu right. So here is Narendra Modi on uh, Valmikis or scavengers. As you know, I mean, after a rock concert on, in Madison uh, Square Garden, he came out and spoke about global hygiene like all good fascists. <laughs> I do not believe, this is Narendra Modi, I do not believe that the Valmikis have doing this job, been doing this job just to sustain their livelihood. Had this been so, they would not have continued with this kind of job generation after generation. At some point of time, somebody must have got the enlightenment that it is the Valmiki's duty to work for the happiness of the entire society and the gods, and that they have to do this job bestowed upon them by the gods. And this job should continue as internal spiritual activity for centuries. You know, Three, uh, on the October 2nd was Gandhi Jayanti, and it, was, it has never been celebrated with so much fervor as when Narendra Modi came to power. And he told all government officers who normally get a holiday on that day that they must go to work and clean their toilets. Uh, I mean, the subtext is just clean your toilet once a year and let someone else do it for you the rest of the time. And then he went to the, uh, you know, the, the Bangis, of course, the Valmikis, as they're called, they, they also live in a segregated settlement in every city. They, they are not allowed to live, uh, you know, with other people. But Modi said that now he was going to be an ideal Bangi, and he was going to go and clean the streets. And I've forgotten to get you the newspaper clipping, but what happened was, first, the Valmikis were made to clean the streets and to just leave a few leaves there for Modi to clean. Then they were locked into their colony while Modi came and in his spotless white clothes and cleaned those leaves and drove away. So this is you know, the, the performance of um, fascism, really. Anyway, so after the round table conference, Gandhi then began working in what is called the temple entry movement. He was trying to bring, he was trying to bring um, he, the untouchable community closer and closer to Hinduism, while Ambedkar was struggling against this. And, and it, was, it, was really, it was really tragic after that, because by the time the 40s approached, the whole uh, emphasis changed to the conflict between Hindus and Muslims, and that became the battleground. And the Congress party managed to, to, to use untouchables who were impressed by Gandhi's missionary activities, which, you know, having faced so much cruelty, was seductive in some ways. And, and, and they began to be used as the outlying army in the, in the battle of partition, where, as you all know, more than a million people, Hindus and Muslims, massacred each other, and Pakistan the land of the pure, the first Islamic republic was born. But even in the middle of all that chaos and all that violence and all that bloodshed, the Pakistani government managed to declare that Valmikis who lived in Pakistan were essential commodities and 
you know, who else was going to clean the shit in the land of the pure? Because in, 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 in the subcontinent, Muslims, Christians, and Sikhs all, all practice untouchability. And, and in what happened as partition came, as it became clear the British were leaving, Gandhi sort of began to withdraw from the business of the state. And he said that, look, quite rightly, he said that the state is the, is the embodiment of all violence. And I believe in the rule of the people, and so on. Now, Ambedkar grew terrified of this. For him, the rule of the people was going to be the rule of the Hindu privileged caste. So he was desperate to try and get whatever safeguards he could in place, which is why he lobbied. And it's a complicated story of how he came to be on the drafting committee of the Constitution, where he did manage to put in some safeguards, though he became very, very unhappy about, about what, the what form the Constitution finally took. And he said, you know, that I, I believe that every generation should have a new Constitution. But then he became in India's first law minister because he was really the only person who was equipped to. He had been working on these issues for so long. And as the first law minister, he said, you know, he believed that caste was controlled through women. And he tried to change the Hindu code bill to bring in laws on divorce, to give women rights to inheritance. The parliament was surrounded by right-wing Hindus, sadhus. He finally resigned in disgust. But today, you know, when you see the statues of Ambedkar, they hold up the Constitution, which is a document that he himself was pretty unhappy with, not the annihilation of caste, which was Ambedkar the revolutionary. So Ambedkar actually was quite nimble in his movement between over the lines, you know, to try to get what he could. And yet, Sometimes he's frozen as the writer of the Constitution, and people get stuck in constitutionalism, and therefore the issue of caste has just become a maze of difficulties. I have not um, spoken at all about Ambedkar's relationship with the left, with the communist movement, which, which ended in a, in a terrible tragedy, because he believed that Brahminism, which was really the anti-caste movement for Hinduism, Brahminism and capitalism were the real enemies of the people. But communists in India, people of the book, therefore people of the privileged caste, simply could not understand what it meant to be an untouchable or a lower caste. And, and all the leaders, even today, of the communist movement are predominantly predominantly of the privileged castes. And there was a huge falling out between union leaders and Ambedkar. And he says in the annihilation of caste that caste is not just a division of labor, but a division of laborers. So, so eventually, watching, uh, watching the way Gandhi managed to manipulate untouchable people, get them back into the Hindu fold, Ambedkar realized you know, uh, he was a man who believed in rationalism, in Western liberalism. Uh, you know, I haven't spoken at all about you know, the, the way Gandhi's suspicion and prophetic understanding, I'd say, of the seed of cataclysm in modern capitalism made him romanticize this very brutal past. And Ambedkar's horror of the brutal past made him embrace Western liberalism for a while, which was catastrophic. But uh, later, towards the end of his life, just a few months before he died, he uh, embraced Buddhism. But even there, it was his own kind of Buddhism, which he developed, uh, his own understanding of it. But he wrote a famous text called The Buddha and His Dhamma. But he didn't have the money to publish it. Nobody in the government would help him publish it. So he died a very tragic figure. He wore suits, yes, but he died in debt. Since 1947, not a single day in India when the Indian army has not been dis deployed within its own borders against, quote, unquote, its own people. And if you look at 
where that army has been deployed. Manipur, Nagaland, Assam, Mizoram, Kashmir, Junagadh, Hyderabad, Goa, Punjab, and now shortly against the poorest people, the indigenous people in central India, you see that the enemy has always been tribals, Christians, Sikhs, Muslims, Dalits. It's a, in, the, in its DNA, it continues to be an upper caste state, a privileged caste state at war and controlling the others. So can caste be annihilated? Well, not unless we show the courage to rearrange the stars in our firmament, not unless those who call themselves revolutionary develop a radical critique of the caste system, and not unless those who understand caste sharpen their critique of capitalism, and not unless we read Baba Saab Ambedkar, if not inside our classrooms, then outside them, and until then we will remain what he called the sick men and women of Hindustan who seem to have no desire to get well. Thank you. But just the numbers of displaced people, most of them Dalits who are untouchables in the caste system or Adivasis, indigenous people, in numbers larger than whole European countries are displaced. But they are not allowed the language of nostalgia or memory or any of that because it's within the idea of the nation state. So you're not allowed, you're not allowed to feel nostalgic about your river or your valley or, or your people because somewhere someone has drawn a map that tells you who you are and who you are not. So um, the book that, that, that was published just before Blo Broken Republic is called Listening to Grasshoppers and the introduction uh, uh, is called Is There Life After Democracy? So I, I'm just going to read you a few uh, parag of the opening paragraphs from which I think we can begin a conversation. Uh, while we're still arguing about whether there's life after death, can we add another question to the cart? Is there life after democracy? What sort of life will it be? By democracy, I don't mean democracy as an ideal or an aspiration. I mean the working model, Western liberal democracy and its variants such as they are. So is there life after democracy? Attempts to answer this question often turn into a comparison of different systems of governance and end with a somewhat prickly combative defense of democracy. It's flawed, we say, it isn't perfect, but it's better than everything else that's on offer. Inevitably, someone in the room will say, Afghanistan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, is that what you would prefer? Whether democracy should be the utopia that all developing societies aspire to is a separate question altogether. I think it should. The early idealistic phase can be quite heady. The question about life after democracy is addressed to those of us who already live in democracies or in countries that pretend to be democracies. It isn't meant to suggest that we lapse into older discredited models of totalitarian authoritarian government, governance. It's meant to suggest that the system of representative democracy, too much representation and too little democracy needs some structural adjustment. The question here really is what have we done to democracy? What have we turned it into? What happens once democracy has been used up, when it has been hollowed out and emptied of meaning? What happens when each of its institutions has metastasized into something dangerous? What happens now that democracy and the free market have fused into a single predatory organism with a thin constricted imagination that revolves almost entirely around the idea of maximizing profit. 
Is it possible to reverse this process? Can something that has mutated go back to being what it used to be? What we need today for the sake of the survival of this planet is long-term vision. Can governments whose very survival depends on immediate, extractive, short-term gain provide this? Could it be that democracy, the sacred answer to our short-term hopes and prayers, the protector of our individual freedoms and nurturer of our avaricious dreams, will turn out to be the end game for the human race? Could it be that but democracy is such a hit with modern humans precisely because it mirrors our greatest folly, our nearsightedness, our inability to live entirely in the present like most animals do, combined with our inability to see very far into the future, makes us strange in-between creatures, <clears throat> neither beast nor prophet. Our amazing intelligence seems to have outstripped our instinct for survival. We plunder the earth hoping that accumulating material surplus will make up for the profound, unfathomable thing that we have lost. And actually, in some ways, the cost of human civilization has been quite fathomable. According to Derek Jensen, author of Endgame, 97% of the Earth's native forests have been destroyed. 98% of native grasslands have been destroyed. There's 10 times as much plastic as there is photoplankton in the ocean. 90% of the big fish in the sea have been wiped out. Amphibian populations are collapsing. Migratory and songbird populations are under threat. And 200 species of insects and animals are driven to extinction every day. These costs must be laid at the doorstep of modern civilization. Today, capitalism is the way civilization aspires to organize itself economically, and democracy is the model of choice for civilized political organization. And these aspirations are what we need to think about carefully. Because not so long ago, you had Western imperial powers waging wars to topple democracies all over Latin America, in Iran, all across Central Asia. And today, you have wars being waged supposedly to install democracies. Why? You know, why has democracy become so user-friendly for the free market? How have they learned to, to take away the threat that democracy actually represents people and put in place these institutions, these rituals which count for democracy while actually impoverishing people or bombarding the imagination to a point where you don't even know that your imagination has been colonized. So when I'm, I'm speaking of a place like India, where we'll come to the fact that there, I mean, the, the wars that were fought in uh, Kashmir and Manipur and Nagaland and Mizoram, in fact, the Indian state from the from the moment it became a sovereign nation, from the moment it shook off the shackles of colonialism, it became a colonial state. And it has waged war since 1947 in Kashmir, Manipur, Nagaland, Mizoram, Telangana, Punjab, Kashmir, Goa, Hyderabad. If you look at it, it's like a state that has been perpetually at war and a military war, and uh, deploying the army against its own people. The state of Pakistan has not deployed its army against its own people in the way the Indian, the democratic Indian state has. And if you look at who are these people that the Indian state chose to fight, in, in all the northeastern states, they were tribal people. In Kashmir, it was the Muslims. In Telangana, it was the tribal people. In Hyderabad, it was the Muslims. In Goa, it was the Christians. In Punjab, it was the Sikhs. So you see this sort of upper caste Hindu state perpetually at war. And in that, 
Within that, there's been the creation of democratic institutions. There has been a constitution which is in very many ways admirable. But each of those institutions has been hollowed out so that it works only for the privileged. So India is a democracy for the few. And it's not a democracy for the vast numbers of millions at whose cost this nation's growth rate is galloping ahead. So while the untouchables, the Adivasis, they are, not, they are not waging any wars of secession. However, they are brutalized. Even if you go to Kashmir, the poorest, most wretched people you will see are Indians living on the streets, living in garbage heaps, collecting garbage, you know? So, so what kind of a democracy is this? That, I mean, uh, in, in recent, in, in the last two years, I have, uh, you know, I've been writing quite a lot about the armed struggles being waged in India, and I'm often accused of being a terrorist sympathizer and a Maoist and so on. And, you know, I've actually written about the nonviolent struggles that have been simply discarded and set aside by the state for so many years. And today, I just ask, I said, you tell me one institution, one democratic public institution that a poor person from a village or a slum whose, whose, whose family members have been killed or tortured or, or dismembered or raped. Tell me one institution in India that this person can go to and expect justice from. And I will withdraw everything I've said. But there isn't an answer to that. And they won't be because, you know, I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but a few years ago, there was an advert campaign by a public private finance, public private initiative from India about propaganda for India. It was selling India as world's largest free market democracy. So you could see that free market because of course that was meant for investment, but democracy element to show itself as different from China. Yeah. And in that sense you're right that it has managed so successfully to sell it to the West mostly. And of course West is not stupid. I mean so they buy it. buying yes. it. I mean, they want to it. Hmm. So it so um, my problem is, you know, you give some examples of why Indian democracy in some sense does not live up to any ideals, even if not, in fact, not even to its own ideals, which might be in the constitution. But could you say more about what is your problem with Indian democracy? Because some would argue that, look, a few years ago we had a Muslim prime president <laughs> and most powerful politician who's Roman Catholic and uh, someone who's untouchable, formerly untouchable, Dalit. So they might come up with ideas that would say, look, we have these figures who are from certain minorities of different kinds who are in positions of power. So if they really want, democracy can work for them. Well, I often say that if you want to know which community is being currently brutalized, you should see who's the president of India. You know, when, they were, when there was the genocide against the Sikhs, then you had a Sikh. Um, you know, the Sikh president. It's a, it, you know, this is what this is what I think is so is so clever and brahmanical about how India functions. It's not uh, it's not easy to see through either intellectually or otherwise, and that's why it's such a challenge. That um, you know, I, I some years ago I wrote a I wrote a small piece. It was called "Do Turkeys Enjoy Thanksgiving." And it was, about, it was about the fact that on Thanksgiving Day, um, there's a turkey that the American president pardons, you know, and that turkey is firstly brought up by some company. It's, 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 it's groomed by a com company called Con Agra Foods. And they say that we teach it to interact with the press and to deal with school children. And you have this turkey that is sort of ceremonially pardoned and then sent off to frying pan park and then millions of other turkeys are slaughtered on Thanksgiving Day. 
So what you have is, just like in apartheid South Africa, you know, you, it, became, it became too raw to have apartheid where you had racist laws in place. So you remove those racist laws. You, you have a few black millionaires who drive around in mercs, but you don't do the ra land reform. You don't do anything that makes money really change hands. You know, you still have an impoverished black uh, population that owns almost no land at all. But they don't have a target, you know, there's no punching bag, there's no bad white man there. And in the same way, in India, you know, it's gone in, the denting and painting has happened, and you've got this new model where it's really very, it's really very hard to, to work it out intellectually, except that the poor don't need to work it out intellectually because they are suffering the consequences. They don't need anybody to interpret their suffering for them, which is why today, all across India, there is insurrection. You know, in, the, in, in central India, there's an armed struggle. In other places, there are militant struggles, Gandhian struggle, whatever you call it, there's a bandwidth of resistance movements. And actually, the fact is that I, I have been told quite straight by, by foreign correspondents for big international newspapers that we have instructions from the editor, no negative stories about India. Because it is the preferred financial de finance destination. However, now in the last, let's say in 2005 or so, if you look at a map of India, you look at, you look at the forests, the tribal population, the minerals, the Maoists, and the, now the security forces are deployed, all stacked on top of each other. Because there is a huge wealth of minerals, things like bauxite and iron ore worth trillions of dollars now, which the multinationals want to get at. And the, in 2005, around 2005, the various state governments signed hundreds of memorandums of understanding to create a kind of, it was a kind of social engineering which, I mean, only, the only person I could imagine could think like that was Stalin, you know, that you, the, the home minister who, who used to be a corporate lawyer who represented all these big mining companies, then became finance minister, and then became the home minister, said that in his vision, he wanted 75% of India to live in the cities, which means 500 million people need to be moved off their lands into the cities. That cannot happen unless India militarizes. And it is militarizing at a speed that you cannot imagine. You know, two years ago, they openly announced Operation Green Hunt which was really a war against the poorest people of the country, the tribal people. And something like 200,000 paramilitary forces were deployed. There was a battle between them and the armed guerrillas in the forest who are Maoists, but also between them and unarmed groups outside the forests in places like Orissa. And, and Many, I have to say, many people, many intellectuals and activists in the Indian middle class stood up and said, this is not acceptable, you know. So those 200 or 300 MOUs, memorandums of understanding, suddenly ground to a halt. And you had this desperate situation where you had these huge industrial contracts being stopped in their tracks by the poorest people in the world you know, which is something you really have to salute. So while the Indian establishment has hollowed out every institution of democracy in the country, democ the spirit of democracy, the ferocity of that belief in the fact that you don't have the right to do this to us is there in the people. And that's a legacy that has come from 
the freedom struggle and all that complexity. And yet the, the middle class and the corporate media in India, the media, I think India is India's probably the country that has the maximum number of 24 hour news channels, all of which are owned by major corporations. 99% of their turnover comes from uh, corporate advertising. So they are like incredibly vicious propaganda machines, 24 hours a day, calling these people who are resisting the takeover of, of their lands terrorists. When, in fact, the Indian Constitution in 1996 had an amendment which says, you are expressly not allowed to take over tribal land for any purpose. But the Prime Minister wants to vandalize the Constitution. The rebels want to actually actualize the Constitution. This is a strange, strange thing that's going on there. And, and in, that, in that battle, which is a real battle in the forests, a propaganda battle in the cities, uh, you know, Operation Green Hunt has various kinds of urban avatars. You have laws that have been passed like the Special Public Security Acts, similar to the laws in Kashmir, the kind of killing that they have been doing in Kashmir, the kind of torture, the kind of humiliation of people in Kashmir and Manipur, those wars have all migrated to the heart of, of, of the country now. And you have torture centers all over, you have the poorest people now in their hundreds imprisoned for waging war against the state or for committing sedition uh, and, and all of that is going on. And uh, yet you know that the battle which has always normally historically been won by these mining companies is in a very interesting stage because on the one hand, while Western countries were developing and industrializing and developing laws of democracy and citizenship and so on, of course they had their colonies where they were committing genocide to extract their raw material. But in India you have today both things happening. You have a country that's modernizing, developing the language of democracy, but having to colonize itself, you know, so I, I always say that the, the most successful secessionist struggle in India has been the secession of the middle and upper classes into outer space, you know, where they've <laughs> joined the rest of the world's elite and they look down and say, what's our bauxite doing in your mountain? What's our water doing in your rivers? And, and actually it's become very difficult for me now to have a conversation where I, use terminology like India or China or so on because, you know, it is the elites that have appropriated to themselves that whole nation. But who says that they are the nation, you know? Yeah. So there is, a, there is a civil war in India and, and now they are actually planning to deploy the army in central India to create a good investment climate. In fact, it reminds me again of the Chinese case, you know, this whole idea of vision for urbanization. Because I think the Communist Party of China has vision of putting 65 or some percentage of people into cities, and that's the order from top down. And of course, the only way in which they can do it is by taking away land. And again, we usually think of, again, China as distinct, but around 80 to 90,000 reported cases of struggle by people who lose land against the state takes place every year in China. So again, issues are somewhat similar in the context of people who are told, we will develop you, of course, because we'll urbanize you, but you have no part in that, you have no say in that. Either you accept what we say or move out. But of course, where will they move out? That's an interesting question. And the law part, I mean, something which you know, the special law firms you're talking about. In Kashmir, it has been there since maybe late 1980s, early 90s. In northeastern India, it has been there since 58. late 1950s. 58. 58, right? The interesting thing is that law essentially says to the military forces that, okay, they can exercise their own discretion in killing someone. 
they can be prosecuted but only with the permission of the central government so I try to find out how many officials have been persecuted uh, not, uh, prosecuted not policy per prosecuted by indian government in kashmir since the law came into power i got the answer zero. zero now i might be wrong but how can you have an emergency law that exists for 20 to 60 years in a country so i mean that says a lot about the situation there i mean so could you say more about because some people here might not know much about the struggle, the Maoist problem per se. Could you hinted at that again? The idea there's a lot of rich. These are rich people. Rich people with resources, rich people with ideas on how to use the resources. It just happens that they're inconvenient for the other rich people who live in cities. I mean, to what extent do you think the Naxalite problem, which would be the Maoist problem, is actually a good way in which you can discipline or push these people down? Well, um, you know, it's, 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 it's such a uh, long history of, of what is known today as the Maoist uh, struggle, which started actually in 1967 in a little village in West Bengal called Naxalbari, which is when a breakaway group from the main sort of parliamentary left, which was the Communist Party of India Marxist, uh, a staged a sort of rural insurrection. And since then, there has been this, uh, the Naxalites have, have been crushed, have been annihilated, and yet they've come back always bigger, stronger. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very interesting thing to talk about today here. Uh, because, you know, earlier today we were talking about Tibet and how, when you look at this whole region geopolitically, it's like, um, I mean, Chinese checkers you know the, the fact that, for example, the radical movements like the Maoists in India would for strategic reasons, no, they, 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 they remained silent about the genocide in Bangladesh because China was at that time an ally of Bangladesh. They will remain silent uh, on Tibet. But within, within India, um, they, they are, I mean, I don't know how Maoist the Maoists really are, but what is happening is that there is a bandwidth of resistance movements. And often, I mean, from the Gandhians to the Gandhian socialists, to the single issue movements like the Narmada movement, to the Maoists who are mostly in the forest areas, who believe in the armed overthrow of the Indian state. I actually went into the forest last year and um, I spent three weeks with the, with the Maoist walking with the comrades. I, I've written about it in, in this and I, I might read you a little bit about it later. But there are huge debates, obviously in the Indian TV studios sponsored by the corporates because the, the battle is becoming increasingly violent. As I said, there's already something like 200,000 paramilitary forces there. The Maoists have a guerrilla army which inflicts serious damage on these security forces. You know, they, they have killed many of them. And then what you get is a sort of atrocity-based analysis where they call people into the stu studio and say, do you believe in violence? And do you believe in killing children? And you know, the sort of moronic level of debate that goes on. And, and in fact, um, what, you know, and then they would try and pit the nonviolent movements like the big anti-dam movement, the Narmada Bachao Andolan, the NBA, versus these increasingly radical armed struggles. But when you go into the forest, as I did, you, you have a vast, a vast tract of forest, of course, sitting on the iron ore and the bauxite and so on. You have forest villages which takes days to walk to, to get there. And you have situations where a thousand, a thousand armed paramilitary will go in. This is now apart from 
what the government called in central India called the Salva Judum, which means uh, it, was a, it was a militia, an armed militia raised from within the sort of tribal elite. And this militia, along with the paramilitary, would go in marching for days into the forest, just burning, looting, raping, just in the district of Bastar, for example. It was, it was a policy called strategic hamleting, which was followed in Vietnam and also by the British in Malaysia against the communists, where they, they want to create this terror and force people out of their villages into roadside camps. So you're talking about something like 600 villages that were terrorized, burned in this way. And something like 50,000 people moved some voluntarily, some forcibly out, out of the forest into these police camps. 350,000 people simply disappeared off the radar. And what kind of people are these? These are the poorest people. You know, they just have a loincloth. They don't have enough to eat a full meal a day. You know, they, they are suffering from levels of malnutrition which doctors have been begun to call nutritional aids because the immunity is so low that you, you just, any disease, you know, tuberculosis, malaria, diarrhea, you die from. So the, these 350,000 people, just in this one district, are off the radar. Now, many of them joined the Maoists and began to fight back, you know. And then, of course, it, began, it became, oh, anybody who says anything, you're a Maoist, you're a Maoist sympathizer, you believe in violence, you're a terrorist, and so on. And I said, look, if you live in a tribal village, four days walk from the road, and a thousand Central Reserve police come and burn your village, what, what should they do? I mean, they're already starving. Can they go on a hunger strike? They don't live in a market economy. They can't you know, be Gandhians and boycott foreign goods. What is it that you expect them to do when something like this happens? You know? and, and actually, what is interesting about it in a more theoretical sense in, in, in what happened in India, I think, is that if you just take the marker back a few years, when, uh, when the, uh, you know, when American capitalism, when free market capitalism won its jihad against Soviet communism in the bleak mountains of Afghanistan, India, which was, which prided itself as a non-aligned country, suddenly somersaulted, became completely aligned and called itself a natural ally of Israel and the US. And this was in the late 80s, as we all know, and then what happened was it opened two crucial locks. One was the lock of an old 14th century mosque called the Babri Masjid, which was a disputed site in Uttar Pradesh, which the Hindus claimed was the birthplace of, of their god, Ram. And the courts had, had just locked that place up and said it's a disputed territory. So that lock was opened, and the other was the lock of the protected Indian markets. And the opening of these two locks unleashed two kinds of totalitarianism. One was Hindu fundamentalism, of course fired by what was happening in Kashmir, which was spoken about earlier, when, when the frustration of rigged elections and so on led to an armed uprising, which fed this Hindutva, and the whole, the whole thing of we want to destroy the Babri Masjid and build a temple to Ram, and you know, the, the Hindu right-wing politicians went touring India and you know, just whipping up this communal feeling. And the opening of the locks of the market led to, to a kind of economic totalitarianism, which has today led to the manufacture of two kinds of terrorism, you know, the Islamist terrorist and the Maoist terrorist. 
So the BJP and the Congress, which are the two major parties, so whoever you vote for in the elections, both are, of course, funded by the same corporates. And whoever wins, you're in a situation where they increasingly militarize. So, so whatever happens, you're caught up in this spiral you know, of increasing militarization. And, and that militarization, or, it has to happen if India has to be a finance destination, because there's too much trouble going on. And these MOUs cannot be actualized unless you have terrorists who can justify your militarization. But if you don't have that armed struggle, then you're going to be wiped out anyway. So, so you're caught in this spiral. And, and to keep up this thing about, oh, India is a great democracy. Like I said, China does sports, so they have the Olympics. And India does democracy, so we have elections. <laughs> but the elections, if you look at the elections, who can stand for elections? Only millionaires. Who can win the elections? Who can campaign? Only those who are sponsored by the corporates. And so you have, you have a situation where actually you've ritualized the whole thing. And the poor, of course, they vote because they need to keep whatever space they can open. You know? So it's not as though the elections are meaningless, though the Maoists say don't vote. But you, you, you're caught in, in such, a, such a fantastically Brahmanical situation where you don't have any you know, open dictatorships or censorship or any of that. But you, have, you, you cannot have real news published in the papers because the corporates own the papers. You know? so, 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 so it's, 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 it's much harder to, to try and and tell the world what's going on in India because you have this, you know, wonderful images of these old people and fellows on bullock carts and old ladies on camels going to vote, but for whom? I mean, they're like two detergents owned by the same holding company, you know? So whoever you vote for, you're ending up so in the same yeah, situation. But what about, let's say, I'm just thinking, because you said, what about people like Mayawati? Mayawati is one of the important politicians in a part of India. So I'm just, what about the fact that, let's say, people like her can be thrown up by democratic well, that, elections? That is, that is the wonderful thing that, you know, you have a, of course, I mean, to an audience like uh, the one here, I can't even begin to get into the fact that the engine that runs Indian politics is caste, you know? And unless you understand caste, you, you know, to read the elections and so on is, you, you'll end up with the, with, the, with the wrong astrology, you know? But anyway, that's a separate thing. But as, as the lower castes, the backward castes, are becoming powerful in terms of their political positions, democracy is being eroded, and everything's owned by the corporates, you know? So it's, it's, that's what's interesting about what's going on. So every mountain, every river, every forest, every dam, every... A uh, water s supply system, every uh, telephone network, everything is owned by the corporates. And, and I mean, this, this is true in India, but it's also true everywhere that with the collapse of, of the environment, with the reducing of the groundwater levels, you increasingly have battles which on the surface seem to be battles of identity. You know, Dalit versus, uh, Dalit Christian versus Adivasi, or Yadavs versus somebody. But, or, or you look at the case of a, a place like Sudan. You know, often what, what appears to be battles of identity are actually battles of desertification, of a fight over resources, of a shrinking, ability to survive. And how, you, how are we going to read these things in the future? You know? And the reason that I find the reason that I find the, the, the walk that I did in the forest with, with the comrades, which uh, I would uh, love mm -hmm. to read you a bit about, but the reason that I found it uh, you know, 
how do I say, intellectually challenging and um, in, in every tactile sense, wonderful, was because I thought, I think, that that to me is the crucial civilizational question. You know, because the battles of identity and struggle are, have, have been there historically. But what is happening there in the forests of central India? That battle for the new imagination, for a, for a new modernity, for a new understanding of how we look at the planet and what we consider civilization and progress. Those questions are being asked in that forest. And those questions have been asked philosophically in universities and classrooms before, yes. But today, people are putting their bodies on the line to ask those very profound questions, you know? And, and, and my question is that you have, let's say, the forest called the Dandakaranya forest, where the, the party that calls itself Maoist consists 99.9% .9 of actually Adivasi uh, tribal guerrilla fighters with a completely different understanding of what constitutes happiness, of what constitutes civilization. They are, they are being annihilated. They have been surrounded they are being cut off from their resources. They can't come out of the forest. They are, they are dying of um, malnutrition, all of that, but they are fighting back. And they are fighting a war of the imagination. They are saying that to a corporate, the bauxite in the mount, the mountain is just a cheap storage facility for the bauxite. They want that bauxite out. They've already sold it on the futures market. They, they don't care what happens. But to that army right now, not as a Maoist army, but as an Adivasi army, that bauxite is the keystone to the ecology. A bauxite mountain is a porous mountain that, that, that uh, retains water, that irrigates the plains, that sustains populations of hundreds of thousands. To them, the bauxite outside the mountain is worthless. They're not asking to fly around in jet aircraft or make missiles or bombs or anything, you know? They don't need it. So can we, as a civilization, allow a non-capitalist society with a sustainable, a possibility of sustainable living live and survive or not? That, I think, is the question. You know, if, if you can, if you, uh, because you need a new imagination. We know that you need a new imagination, neither communist nor capitalist. And maybe the people who we think of as relics of the past are actually the gatekeepers of the future. And if they are to survive, they need a physical space to survive, not, I'm not talking about Native American reservoirs, you know, real physical space to survive. Can we leave the bauxite in the mountain or not? Because if we can't, then I don't think we should be preaching morality to the victims of this war and telling them whether they should be violent or non-violent or whatever it is, you know. Would you want to read from that part on walking with comrades? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I'll just read, I mean, it's a very long essay. I'll just read a, a little bit of uh, how, I, how I actually just went into the forest. The terse typewritten note slipped under my door in a sealed envelope, confirmed my appointment with India's biggest internal security challenge. That was what the Prime Minister calls them. I'd been waiting for months to hear from them. I had to be at the Ma Danteshwari Mandir temple in Dantewara, Chhattisgarh, 
at any four given times on two given days. That was to take care of bad weather, punctures, blockades, transport strikes, and sheer bad luck. The note said, writer should have camera, tikka, tikka is in Bindi, and coconut. Meter will have a cap, a Hindi outlook magazine, and bananas. The password will be Namaskar Guruji. Namaskar Guruji. I wondered whether the meter and greeter would be expecting a man and whether I should get myself a mustache. There are many ways to describe Dantewada. It's an oxymoron. It's a border town smack in the heart of India. It's the epicenter of a war. It's an upside down, inside out town. In Dantewara, the police wear plain clothes and the rebels wear uniforms. The jail superintendent is in jail and the prisoners are free. 300,000 of, 300 of them escaped from the old town jail a few years ago. Women who have been raped are in police custody. The rapists give speeches in the bazaar. Across the Indravati River, in the area controlled by the Maoists, is the place the police call Pakistan. There, the villages are empty, but the forest is full of people. Children who ought to be in school run wild. In the lovely forest villages, the concrete school buildings have either been blown up and lie in a heap, or they're full of policemen. The deadly war that's unfolding in the jungle is a war that the government of India is both proud and shy of. Operation Green Hunt has been proclaimed as well as denied. P. Chidambaram, India's home minister and the CEO of this war says it doesn't exist and that it's a media creation. And yet substantial funds have been allocated to it and tens of thousands of troops are being mobilized for it. Though the theater of war is in the jungles of central India, it will have serious consequences for us all. If ghosts are the lingering spirits of someone or something that has ceased to exist, then perhaps the National Mineral Development Corporation's new four-lane highways crashing through the forest is the opposite of a ghost. Perhaps it's the harbinger of what is still to come. The antagonists in the forest are disparate and unequal in almost every way. On one side is a massive paramilitary force armed with the money, the firepower, the media, and the hubris of an emerging superpower. On the other, ordinary villagers armed with traditional weapons backed by a superbly organized, hugely motivated Maoist guerrilla fighting force with an extraordinary and violent history of armed rebellion. The Maoists and the paramilitary are old adversaries and have fought older avatars of each other several times before, in Telangana, in Bihar, in Andhra Pradesh in the 60s and 70s, and then again in Andhra, Bihar, and Maharashtra. All the way through. Anyway, it goes on. And then uh, I'll just read the part where I arrived uh, in the forest. I arrived at the Ma Danteshwari Mandir well in time for a, my appointment, first day, first show. I had my camera, my small coconut, and a powd powdery red tikka on my forehead. I wondered if someone was watching me and having a laugh. Within minutes, a young boy approached me. He had a cap and a backpack school bag, chipped nail polish on his fingernails, no Hindi outlook, no bananas. Are you the one who's going in, he asked me. No, Namaskar Guruji. I didn't know what to say. He took out a soggy note from his pocket and handed it to me. It said, Outlook nahi mila, means I couldn't find the outlook. <laughs> and the bananas, I asked him. I ate them, he said, I got hungry. <laughs> he, he really was a security threat. His backpack said, Charlie Brown, not your ordinary blockhead. <laughs> he said his name was Mangtu. 
I soon learned that Dandakaranya, the forest I was about to enter, was full of people who had many names and fluid identities. It was like balm to me, that idea. How lovely not to be stuck with yourself, to become someone else for a while. We walked to the bus stand only a few minutes away from the temple. It was already crowded. Things happened quickly. There were two men on motorbikes. There was no conversation, just a glance of acknowledgement, a shifting of body weight, the revving of engines. I had no idea where we were going. We passed the house of the superintendent of police, which I recognized from my last visit. He was a candid man, the superintendent. See, ma'am, frankly speaking, this problem can't be solved by us police or military. The problem with these tribals is that they don't understand greed. Unless they become greedy, there's no hope for us. <laughs> I've told my boss, remove the force and instead put a TV in every home. Everything will be automatically sorted out. In no time at all, we were riding out of town. No tail. It was a long ride, three hours by my watch. It ended abruptly in the middle of nowhere on an empty road with a forest on either side. Mangtu got off, I did too. The bikes left and I picked up my backpack and followed the small internal security challenge into the forest. It was a beautiful day. The forest floor was a carpet of gold. In a while, we emerged on the white, sandy banks of a broad, flat river. It was obviously monsoon-fed, so now it was more or less a sand flat. At the, at the center, a stream ankle-deep and easy to wade across. And across was Pakistan. Out there, ma'am, the candid SP had said to me, my boys shoot to kill. I remembered that as we began to cross. I saw us in a policeman's rifle sights, tiny figures in a landscape, easy to pick off. But Mangtu seemed quite unconcerned, and I took my cue from him. Waiting for us on the other bank in a lime green shirt that, had, that said Horlix was Chandu, a slightly older security threat, maybe 20. He had a ready smile, a cycle, a jerry can with boiled water, and many packets of glucose biscuits for me from the party. We caught our breath and began to walk again. The cycle, it turned out, was a red herring. The route was an almost entirely non-cyclable. We climbed steep hills and clambered down rocky paths along some pretty precarious ledges. When he couldn't wheel it, Chandu lifted the cycle and carried it over his head as though it weighed nothing. I began to wonder about his bemused village boy air. I discovered much later that he could handle every sort of weapon, except for an LMG, a light machine gun. He informed me cheerfully. Three beautiful, sozzled men with flowers in their, in their turbans walked past, walked with us for about half an hour before our paths diverged. At sunset, their shoulder bags begin, began to crow. They had roosters in them, which they had taken to market, but hadn't managed to sell. Anyway, goes on. <laughs> In fact, uh, I'll have something and then we'll open up for question and answer. I mean, what you're talking about is also militarization of, let's say, society in general, right? In that context, I mean, I'm, I'm interested, I mean, how are things, in your view, then similar? I mean, you highlight some similarity with Kashmir and Manipur and Nagaland and other places and Mizoram. And many people in India also don't know that Indian Air Force was used in Mizoram in 1960s. And most people think that it's somehow alien to use Air Force against your own people, but Indian state had been using it for long. I'm just wondering, so is the struggle, let's say, in Kashmir or Tibet, or it's a different continent, so in your view, is it, I mean, what is the struggle about? Is it, or I shouldn't be saying ought to be about, but is it, is it about the injustice? I mean, what is the similarity and difference with the kind of struggle you have been looking at? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I have, um, of course, um, you know, I mean, every time I speak in India now, there's a physical attack on me by the Hindu right for, for, for the things that I have said about Kashmir. 
and one of the things I said was that India needs azadi, as in freedom, from Kashmir as much if not more than Kashmir needs azadi from India. Because the, the, the corrosion of the, of, the, of, the, of the imagination of the Indian citizen, you know, to tolerate that kind of corrosion that, that, that is being done in your name is something extremely dangerous. Leave alone the corrosion of institutions like the army. In, in Kashmir, the army has become the police. It's a, it's a bloated administrative force. In Chhattisgarh, the police are becoming the army. All over India, they're going to start these, what are called warfare training schools, where army people are training the police to kill, to do combat, to kill, to kill the poor, basically. You know, yesterday on, on the interview, uh, somebody asked me, you know, but they say that they are going to eradicate poverty in India by, nine, 19, in, by, uh, in another, by 2020. And, and I think they might by eradicating the poor, you know. So what, it is an issue of justice. However, there are huge differences too. Because always in struggles of national self-determination, they consist of a middle class. And that changes the nature of the struggle. It changes the nature of the insult, you know. Uh, and today it allows you to be on Facebook or Twitter or so on. Nobody in the Dandakaranya forest is on Twitter or Facebook or even has a cell phone, you know, let alone enough food to eat. So. So there's a, there's a collusion of the Indian elite now, you know? And I think, I think that, that struggle is what, what I'm very interested in at the moment because, because it's, a, it's, it's a fight of the imagination, you know? And in India, what has happened is that it was a feudal society, a very unequal feudal caste-ridden and communal society. It's not that anything new has happened. But all those knobs have been turned too high. And after the markets opened in 1990, it's as if there was a great churning. And what was a sort of, um, you know, a society which, 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 was, which had a little, a thin layer of cream on top of, of, of the native elite created by the colonial government separated into a thicker layer of cream and the rest is water. And the thick layer of cream is the market, where a huge market, because it's a huge country, and it's the market that buys the phones and the cars and the air conditioners and the whole world's business has its eyes on that. But that market was created at the cost of this huge underclass, which in fact, does not have any place to put its feet because it's being displaced in the, by the millions by these big infrastructure projects. And when it comes to the cities, it's been thrown out of the cities by the same institutions like the Supreme Court. You know? so, so actually, they just want, it's like the toxic waste that's being sloshed around, but now it's digging its heels in and fighting back. And that, to me, in India, I mean, in, in India, the, the fascinating thing about India is like, uh, uh, you know, not only does it live in several centuries simultaneously, it also has every battle being fought, every battle, every kind of battle is being fought there, you know? And what is wonderful about it is that it still has an imagination of another kind of world that has not been annihilated, which is seeking to be annihilated, but it has not been annihilated. And, and that is what makes it such a, such a, a fascinating, intellectually challenging, and uh, a place which, which none of us can look away from, you know, at least I certainly can't, you know, because 
it's it, the complexity uh, just intellectually and ap apart from observationally or in narrative ways or sto you know it's so it's it's so unbelievable the all that is going on there right now but what, i mean i I, I'll reduce my finish, you know, the concluding speech. It's okay, you know. I'm just uh, thinking, I mean, what, but why can't you close your eyes? I mean, the reason I'm asking is because most of the Indian middle classes close their eyes. In fact, they, in fact, they don't know, they pretend not to know, or they don't want to know. And I remember I, I heard, uh, you know, a BBC News Night interview yesterday, you know, with you. And so I think Jeremy said that you are an unlikely ally of the mouse. I said, why unlikely? I mean, what you're saying makes perfect sense to me. I, mean, I might disagree or agree with some things, but it makes sense. It doesn't come across as anything you know, that dangerous or seditious. I'm, I'm just wondering why un, I mean, why are you, okay, let me rephrase it. What kind of costs exist for intellectuals in India now not to be like you? Well, I think w the other interesting thing about being a so-called democracy in a state with as much conflict as there is in India is perhaps the difference between, let's say, um, Pakistan and India, where if you have a military, a, a tradition of military dictatorship, you, you surely have, you know, apparently in Pakistan, 10 families that own Pakistan and the, the army that owns a lot of the real estate and so on. But in India, you have an elite, which is the state, because it is a democracy for the elite. They have their own media, they have their own crises, they have their own, you know, they have their own protests about their own small issues, uh, candlelight vigils and so on, you know. Whereas the rest of, so, so there's a light that's being shone on them and then everything else is in darkness. But what is happening in the, in the last, I think, few years is that even among the middle classes, there is a fracturing of opinion on issues like Kashmir, but also on issues like this. Because everybody can sense that things just can't go on, you know? And, and if you just look at the growth rate, for example, just the mining issue, what is the government doing? It's selling these, what they call natural resources, which is such a horrible word, but anyway, let's use it, to corporates for just a small royalty. You know, so it's not, it, it's, it's crazy. It's like, it's like Latin America at some stage, you know, when Eduardo Galeano wrote The Open Veins of Latin America. It's, it's like that. It's a kind of gold rush that's going on. So even people in the middle class are beginning to understand that. So you have, uh, like I told you what Operation Green Hunt was, where they actually offic officially declared war on the, on the, tribal people. But they also have an urban avatar of Operation Green Hunt, which is how do you deal with these intellectuals and these activists who you can't just kill or jail because you have to continue to be a democracy. If you're not a democracy, you're not a good finance destination. So how do you, how do you deal with those people, you know? So, so what, it, what has happened is the the major institutions of Indian democracy, the media, the courts, the parliament, all of that has been outsourced to the corporates. The lower echelons of democracy has been outsourced to the mob. So how would they deal with, some, say, somebody like me? Initially, they did consider for about you know, 10 days, there was endless, endless, endless um, TV programs where the television companies, the television anchors, were, 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 were just rooting for me to be charged with sedition on the issue of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. But then the government realized that if they were to go after me on sedition, it would internationalize the Kashmir issue, which is just what they didn't want to do. So then how, so, so what you do is you outsource it. So you have a few people who are, the case is pending in court, 
it's not dismissed, it's not uh, uh, decided, so you just keep this person hanging. Or um, you have this doctor called Binayak Sen, who was a, who was a doctor in, in Chhattisgarh, who, who they charged with sedition and put him, you know, sentenced him to life imprisonment. Then there was a huge campaign, which the media was very enthusiastic about, to free him. But now that campaign is very interesting, because what was the campaign? Dr. Binayak Sen is innocent, which means everybody else is guilty. But here's this nice middle class man who's innocent. And once you free him, you're a democratic state, right? But all the hundreds of other nameless tribal people who don't have lawyers and don't have campaigns are still there. But you've got your reputation sorted out, you know? Uh, with me, for example, a few months ago, I spoke at a public meeting in Bombay. It was a, it was a packed meeting, and at that meeting I said, the, the Maoists had just killed 70 uh, security forces. So the whole TV was up in arms, and all of us were being called traitors, and you know, the atrocity-based analysis that I'm talking about. And I said, look, what are 70 CRPF people with AK-47s and rocket propellers doing running around tribal villages? You know, we would like to know. And anyway, I said, look, there is this bandwidth of resistance movements from the Maoists to the Gandhians and everybody in between. They have serious ideological and tactical arguments with each other. But none of them is in any doubt about what they're fighting. They are fighting the corporatization, and they're fighting the free market. They're fighting the dispossession, uh, the, the displacement of, of people. I said, I stand on this side of the line with this resistance. And from this side of the line, I turn around to ask my comrades, will you leave the bauxite in the mountain? So luckily for me, the mainstream press was there and you know they have this sort of strange relationship with me because they, they can't uh, you know success is a big deal in India now and so if you it's become my middle name you know Arundhati Booker Prize winner Roy so how do you kind of just discount this person so anyway luckily it was reported accurately but there's a organization called the Press Trust of India PTI which is quite often used by intelligence uh, agencies. The intelligence agencies use the media, the army uses the media big time. So it reported that Arundhati Roy saluted the Maoists for killing policemen and dared the government to come and arrest her. And this was published in every language newspaper all over the country. The idea was firstly to make me sound crude and ridiculous and anti-national and all of that. Uh, the next, I was in Bombay, but that, that the next day in the evening, uh, um, two, a few people on motorcycles came to my house, along with the TV crew, started to stone it and film it so that now the next thing would be on TV, the people are angry with Arundhati Roy, you know? And then the BJP spokespeople in Chhattisgarh would give statements saying she should be shot in public and all of this. So you just create this, this is the urban avatar of Operation Green Hunt. Uh, what they didn't take into account and nor did I was having had that ridiculous statement that I never made published in the paper, I went to the next city to speak, Chennai, and at the airport, everybody hugged me and said, well said. And I was like, I didn't say it, <laughs> but anyway. So, uh, it's, 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 it's a complicated no. dance, you know? <laughs> it's, it's interesting, you see, so it's always what you say, how people hear it, mm -hmm. and of course, the different audiences. But now, we have time for very few, I mean, well, I will have only a few questions. So, who are the people who want questions? You can start with that gentleman there. And then we'll take three questions together. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah. So it would be Greg. Thanks. Yep. Hello. So Greg, it would be him, and then him, and then you come in front, and we'll go next time to your side. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, I mean, I think I am uh, one of the younger generations of India, and 
I see India in a very different picture than you. I think it's on, just do yeah, move I it. Think, yeah. Is it fine? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so I think I am a part of the uh, younger generation of India who sees India in a very different way than you do. I think maybe you are too intelligent to see it in a way I'm not able to see. But I'm just thinking uh, uh, that you say that there are extremist movements or by the poor that are going on from uh, Punjab to Hyderabad to Meghalaya and Mizoram and all these places. Uh, I, I don't free, I know the so-called truth, but uh, even if I believe your view, I think somehow your views would somehow lead India divided into 10 different more countries. And if the intelligentsia like you, whom I really respect and look up to, if somehow you support or not or unknowingly or knowingly support these so-called poor people, I think uh, <laughs> it would add oil to fire and I think soon our country would be divided into further 10 more countries okay. or something like that. Thank you. Can we move? Where, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, the one with blue t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, you can hear. Hi. Um, I was just uh, wondering if you, um, if you could talk about a little bit about the Forest Rights Act of 2006 and if that had any effect on uh, the power balance or the legitimacy or otherwise kind of in front of the state of, on one hand, the tribal people, Adibasi people, and on the other side, the kind of encroaching market forces and whether that act was essentially lip service or whether it's actually made any tangible difference at all. If you have the chance, that would be great. Thank, okay, you. thank you. And one, which, oh yeah, the one red, and then we'll take, yeah, I, I'll remember the question for them. <laughs> Her and then, yeah. Um, I would like to know, since you said that um, the democratic institutions of India are, have become hollow, if, if that means looking back at the past of the 50s and 60s and 70s, do you think that democracy has actually ever worked in India, um, looking at kind of like the Fabian socialism and the poverty populism of the 70s? And, and my other question would be, um, do you actually think that democracy as maybe a Western concept is actually um, realistic for India of today, for the um, considering the regional disparities, and or is democracy just not really anything for India? Okay, thank. You. We'll take the three questions, then I'll come to you and you. So, so, yeah. so first one is about uh, that the, the so-called so poor. The so-called poor. <laughs> They're all pretending to be poor. <laughs> Secretly, they eat McDonald's. <laughs> um, no, I understand. I understand what you're saying, you know, and I also understand your anxiety. But first of all, I think you have to you have to understand that if if you want to privilege the idea of a unified nation never mind the cost to its people. You know, never mind that there are more poor people in India than in the poorest countries in Africa put together, and never mind that these policies that the government is following is manufacturing that poverty. Then what can I say, you know? Because um, to me, that is not paramount, you know, what uh, who calls themselves an Indian or how do you define India or what is that definition in itself? You know, it's, it has, I mean, India is more diverse than all of Europe put together. You know, it has more religions, more languages and all of that. Many of them jostling, many of them being suppressed. But right now, what is happening is not something that I am creating. You know, I am talking about a situation that has become explosive. And unless you address it, I mean, I would actually uh, like to, I wrote an essay in 1999, right? Uh, this was on the, it was called The Greater Common Good, and it was about the anti-dam movement, which was obviously a Gandhian, uh, non-violent, 
movement and to me still that argument is the most profound uh, argument of all the political things that I've written about because it doesn't just concern people, it concerns fish and water and justice and the environment and the ecosystem and everything. And it's a long essay, but uh, it's, you know, just remember that it was written 12 years ago. And it was at the time when I was somebody who, who was totally supporting nonviolent resistance. The last person I met in the valley was Bhai Ji Bhai. He's a Tadvi Adivasi from Undava, one of the first villages where the government began to acquire land for the canal. Bhai Ji Bhai lost 17 of his 19 acres to the Narmada Canal, which crashes through his land 700 feet wide. But he doesn't count as a project of affected person because only those who are affected by the reservoir count as project affected. So these are all the games that they play, you know. Uh, 23,000 families were people like Bhai Ji Bhai who would be seriously affected, but they don't count as project affected. And like his neighbors in Kevadia colony, Bhai Ji Bhai had become a pauper overnight. Bhai Ji Bhai and his people forced to smile for photographs on government calendars. Bhai Ji Bhai and his people denied the grace of rage. Bhai Ji Bhai and his people squashed like bugs by this country they are supposed to call their own. It was late evening when I arrived at his house. We sat down on the floor and drank over sweet tea in the dying light. As he spoke, a memory stirred in me, a sense of deja vu. I couldn't imagine why. I knew I hadn't met him before. And then I realized what it was. I hadn't recognized him, but I remembered his story. I'd seen him in an old documentary film shot more than 10 years ago in the valley. He was frailer now, his beard softened with age. He's dead now. But his story hadn't aged. It was still young and full of passion. It broke my heart, the patience with which he told it. I could tell that he had told it over and over and over again, hoping, praying that one day one of the strangers passing through Undava would turn out to be good luck or God. Bhai ji bhai, bhai ji bhai, when will you get angry? When will you stop waiting? When will you say, that's enough, and reach for your weapons, whatever they may, they may be? When will you show us the whole of your resonant, terrifying, invincible strength? When will you break the faith? Will you break the faith, or will you let it break you? And this was, you know, many years ago. And, and, and as you can see, when a government has consistently ignored reasonable nonviolent dissent, it has by default privileged armed struggle. And so to me, it is not anymore a possibility to preach morality to the victims of the war that the government is, of India is waging on a majority of its people. There was a question about Forest Act and then the question about has democracy ever worked? Ah, yes, the question about the Forest Act, actually even more important than the Forest Act, was an act called PESA, which is the Panchayat Extension of Scheduled Areas Act, which became a constitutional amendment, which disallows the, uh, the acquisition of tribal land. And like many provisions in the Indian law and in the Indian constitution, they are used as window dressing. You know, so when something, when somebody starts to oppose the state, they say, but look, you're opposing this very enlightened constitution, or we have this very, very wonderful law. And it becomes, again, that much harder to, to see through it, you know? So, um, 
this is the situation today where you have an establishment which has passed a set of laws, some of which are quite enlightened, but it's constantly vandalizing its own laws. And those who are being called rebels and terrorists and resistance people who are being put into jail for sedition are only asking that the constitution be implemented. Um, your question about democracy and Indian democracy in the 50s. See, obviously, you know, when you're coming out of uh, centuries of colonization, democracy doesn't just, uh, you know, fall from the sky and begin to work. But obviously, there were dreams when India became free. People, not just people, but even however much, however many arguments you might have, and I do have many with people like Gandhi or Nehru or Ambedkar. There was a sort of idealism, obviously in the air, because that is, that is what pushed through the freedom struggle. But uh, again, that's something I write about in this book, that let's say in 1977, 1975, there was, uh, uh, Mrs. Gandhi declared an emergency. Why did she declare an emergency? Because there was a huge unrest in the country. Apart from the Naxalite uprising of the 60, late 60s, which was crushed by the 70s, there was a call for what's called Sampurna Kranti by Jay Prakash Narayan, which was total revolution. There was a whole movement for redistribution of land, for land reforms, for returning land to the tiller. There, there, was, there was still people dreaming of justice. Today, it's, it's not that people are asking for land to the tiller. They are, they, are, they are fighting to prevent what little they have being snatched by the corporates. In, in West Bengal, um, people, people were being called Maoists and shot and killed. Some of them were Maoists. But they, you know what their demand was? The first demand was that the police who had gone in and beaten and raped and vandalized a few tribal villages. They said, we just want the police to come and apologize. That's all. How can the police apologize to tribal people? It's not possible. And it slowly became, it slowly became a bloody war, you know? So at that time in the 70s, there was still the dreams of justice. Today, justice, the idea of justice in the whole world has disappeared and been re replaced by the idea of human rights, which as George Bush said, a few will do. You know, it's such a narrow thing, human rights and human rights violations. So um, I, think, I think the whole idea of what we once dreamt of has changed. First here and then here and then there, that's all. So we won't have time for more, sorry, sir. Thank you, thank you for a very stimulating talk, as expected. Um, I have two comments and there might be a question in there as well. Um, first is about the fact that in the last 20 years under neoliberalism, um, according to figures from the Indian government and um, international organizations, 100 million people have been raised above the poverty line. That's uh, because the poverty line moves up and down. Okay, I'm not going to say that, that, that is itself you know, problematic, how you define poverty line, and there have been questions about it, but uh, the fact that there has been change. Um, my question really is about what do you feel the civil society is doing towards addressing those questions? In relation to, for example, um, the Lokpal Bill and Anna Hazare's movement and the way that has been supported by at least certain sections of the media. Um, and my other point, before I stop, is um, when you were reading from your jungle journey, I thought I've read it somewhere. And I was thinking, where have I read it? And if I'm right, I think it was the outlook. Yeah. yeah. Which is not an underground, you know, radical journal. It's a very mainstream magazine. Um, published by a corporate house, 
and it gives space to the kind of arguments that you are very persuasively making. So there is something to be said also about that diversity and complexity of media system. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We have uh, Wong Li Xiong here, and then.你好我只能用中文来问这个问题我认为毛的这个就是毛主义这条道路是不可改善如果不是的话，那么民主是应该呃放弃掉呢，走一条新的道路。那条新的道路是什么？Unless hidden talent is also understanding Chinese, I think she'll have to translate. Yes. Sir. <laughs> I myself is from Mao Zedong, Mao's um, um, home country, and I myself experienced Mao's torture, and my parents as well. Uh, I think Maoism Mao is too idealistic. It was, it originally wanted to make heaven, but in fact it made hell on earth. And what did the democracy do? From the 1950s, when the black people could not, could not be on the same bus with white people, but now Mr. Obama has been the president of the United States. So my question is, um, is this the problem of democracy? Is, is democracy, can democracy be improved or shall we give it up? Um, do you have like new um, paths to solve this problem? Okay, thank you, and final one there. Um, thank you for this excellent talk. Um, my question would be um, in this particular context, what do you think is or ought to be the role of um, diasporic Indian communities in these debates? Should they or should they not be involved and to what extent? Thanks. Okay, the first uh, question about civil society and Anahazar, I, I don't know how many of you are aware of the, the Anna Hazare phenomenon. Are you? Yes. Well, basically, it has a it has a short history, which is that um, you know in the last in the last year or so, there's been just the most massive corporate scams uncovered one after another in India. Much many of them to do with mining, but the latest one was called the 2G scam, where they were selling spectrum, you know, frequency for uh, to corporates for some really sort of um, dirt cheap prices and then those corporates were selling them on for huge amounts, I mean billions of dollars of profit and, and it was found that everybody was involved, you know, the politicians, the media, the corporates in trying to jockey for who the information minister should be, who the IT minister should be, and so on. And um, the, the whole, you know, what many of us had been talking about for, for, for a long time, suddenly this whole bunch of cell phone conversations that was tapped and it was really a corporate war between one corporate company and another, and they were released to the public. And we heard, you know, major media anchors and media editors and corporates and ministers having conversations about how judges could be fixed, how columns should be written, how the whole operation should take place. And it was like a sort of MRI confirming a diagnosis that some of us had made a long time ago. 
and that and 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 then uh, uh, an old Gandhian called Anna Hazare, basically about two months ago, went on a very public fast, asking for a so, sort of bill where a group of citizens which consisted of lawyers and public figures and ju judges would pass a bill where they could sort of oversee uh, a, a more transparent form of functioning. And this fast became a huge sort of middle class fetish and the, and the media was supporting it like crazy and the, everybody, the most corrupt people were also supporting it, the fascists were supporting it, the left wing and the right wing and everybody, it was a bit of a spectacle, you know. But through it all, perhaps, I don't know actually, I think that, any, you know, there's a huge standoff right now because the Lokpal committee consisted of five members from civil society and five members from the government and I don't think that anything really radical can ever be agreed upon. But, but the problem uh, with something like this is, of course, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, there's no harm in something like that happening. But the real issue is questioning the policies that lead to these levels of corruption. You know, at the time when India was selling out and privatizing all its public infrastructure, we were told that, oh, the government is very corrupt, it's a systemic problem, that's why you need to privatize. But now you find that privatization has led to corruption many, many hundred times the scale. But now it's not being discussed as a systemic problem, it's just being discussed as a moral problem that needs to be overseen, you know? Whereas some of us are saying, if you can just make public these memorandums of understanding that you've signed, why shouldn't we know? We would like to know what are these memorandums, who are the companies, how much have you sold things for, what are the prospects, you know? But all that is secret. So there's this, you know, it's a, it's a strange tension that's going on. How, why were the corporates also uh, funding this fast? People had a lot of jokes about why was the hunger fast being funded by the corporates? Because they also wanted to pirouette on stage as people who are against corruption, whereas they were the engines of corruption in the first place, you know? So this word, civil society, has also become a word, a, a phrase that some of us have developed a rash about, you know, because um, it's like in, 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 in Delhi you have this place called Jantar Mantar and India Gate where, where protests happen. But the only kind of protests that are allowed there are, you know, middle class protests where you know, there was this model called Jessica who was killed. And so if you go and say justice for Jessica and you have a candle and they allow it and the media films it and all that. But if you're protesting against displacement, poor people being displaced by a dam or a mine or something, then they don't allow you to go to India Gate. So I always say you should have a banner saying justice for Jessica on fr in the front, <laughs> get there and then turn it around. <laughs> You know, but um, the second question about Mao's China, you know, I I I completely I completely understand what you're saying, and none of us are, at least I'm certainly not. Though the Maoists do tend to tend to sort of elide the history of what happened under Mao in China, they. They talk a lot about the guerrilla tactics and the long march, but they, they don't really want to discuss the cultural revolution or the great leap forward, or indeed the, what happened in Stalinist Russia. But um, however, I think to, to, try and, to try and compare uh, the fact that America has Barack Obama as as a black president, A, just like having a Sikh president doesn't make India a country that's kind to Sikhs, or a Muslim president doesn't make it a country that's 
kind to Muslims. You need the black, the white mask and the black face or whatever. But can you forget the history of American wars? I mean, are we going to forget the history of Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan uh, because those those killings did not happen within the borders of America. You know, what about the um, genocide of native Indians on which the American nation rests? You know, so I don't think we should have a, uh, the algebra of infinite justice, you know, like the, the sort of who has killed how many people in order to justify one thing from another. I think, um, what I will say is that what the world is missing today is not, we're not talking about junking democracy and bringing in some totalitarian Maoist regime. That's not what is on the cards. But I think what we, none of us, have a proper answer to is before we discuss the ideal politics of governance. We need to know how to become an effective resistance because that's the only way that you can have an ideal or a close to ideal kind of government. We know that before the Iraq war, all the people in the countries that actually attacked Iraq, the people didn't want the war, but the governments didn't have to listen to them. There is no way today that people really can be represented by their governments other than voting. You know, so how do you have a system in which um, democratic governments actually represent their people? They don't represent their people because resistance has been, we don't, we don't know the secrets of an effective resistance anymore, which is why I salute what is happening in India at a terrible price, but the fact that the poorest people in the world have stopped the richest corporations in their tracks. It's a huge thing. I think the final question was about role of diaspora, if you could say it briefly. The, low, the role of the diaspora, I mean, I think it depends on the diaspora. No, the diaspora are not some homogenous uh, group. I mean, it depends on how much, who knows about what, you know, there are, pl like, there are many, many uh, organizations um, who have done a lot of very good work, uh, you know, against sort of forcing, forcing organizations to pull out funding from, uh, from uh, dams or other kinds of destructive projects. But, you know, I can't give you a sort of generic answer to that, to that question. Uh, you, you'll also, I mean, it, it leads into a whole debate about the role of NGOs, you know, and how NGOs have, I mean, they have a complicated role. Some NGOs do good things, but NGOs have been used to neutralize resistance and dissent in very serious ways, which has to be examined, but it's a whole other subject. You want to end with the reading? Okay. So this is the last three minute reading from the introduction to this book, The Broken Republic. It's called The President Took the Salute. The minister says that for India's sake, people should leave their villages and move to the cities. He's a Harvard man. He wants speed and numbers. 500 million migrants he thinks would make a good business model. Not everybody likes the idea of their cities filling up with the poor. A judge in Mumbai called slum dwellers pickpockets of urban land. Another said, while ordering the bulldozing of unauthorized colonies, that people who couldn't afford it shouldn't live in cities. When those who had been evicted went back to where they came from, they found their villages had disappeared under great dams and quarries. Their homes were occupied by hunger and policemen. The forests were filling up with armed guerrillas. War had migrated too, 
from the edges of India in Kashmir, Manipur, Nagaland, to its heart. So the people returned to the crowded city streets and pavements. They crammed into hovels on dusty construction sites, wondering which corner of this huge country was meant for them. Now the minister said that migrants to the cities were mostly criminals and, quote, carried a kind of behavior which is unacceptable to modern cities. The middle class admired him for his forthrightness, for having the courage to call a spade a spade. The minister said he would set up more police stations, recruit more policemen, and put more police vehicles on the road to improve law and order. To make Delhi a world-class city for the 210 Commonwealth Games, laws were passed that made the poor vanish like laundry stains. Street vendors disappeared. Rickshaw pullers lost their licenses. Small shops and businesses were shut down. Beggars were rounded up, tried by mobile magistrates in mobile courts, and dropped outside the city limits. The slums that remained were screened off with vinyl billboards that said, Delhi, issuously, yours. New kinds of policemen patrol the streets, better armed, better dressed, and trained not to scratch their privates in public, no matter how grave the provocation. <laughs> there were cameras everywhere recording everything. Two young criminals carrying a kind of behavior which was unacceptable to modern cities escaped the police dragnet and approached a woman sandwiched between her sun sunglasses and the leather seats of her shiny car at a traffic crossing. Shamelessly, they demanded money. The woman was rich and kind. The criminals' heads were no higher than her car window. Their names were Rukmini and Kamli, or maybe Mehrunisa and Shahbano. Who cares? The woman gave them money and some motherly advice. 10 rupees to Kamli or Shabano. Share it, she told them, and sped away when the lights changed. Rukmini and Kamli, or Mehrunisa and Shabano, tore into each other like gladiators, like lifers in a prison yard. Each sleek car that flashed past them and almost crushed them carried the reflection of their battle, their fight to the finish on its shining door. Eventually, both girls disappeared without a trace like thousands of children do in Delhi. But the games were a success. Two months later, on the 62nd anniversary of India becoming a republic, the armed forces showcased their new weapons at the Republic Day Parade. Russian multi-barrel rocket launchers, combat aircraft, light helicopters, and underwater weapons for the Navy. The new T-90 battle tank was called Bhishma. The older one was Arjun. Varunastra was the name of the latest heavyweight torpedo, and Marich was a decoy system to seduce incoming torpedoes. Hanuman and Vajra are the names painted on the armored vehicles that patrol Kashmir's frozen streets. That the names were drawn from Hindu epics was just a coincidence. If India is a Hindu nation, it's only an accident. Daredevils from the Army Corps of Signals rode motorcycles in a rocket formation. Then they formed a cluster of flying birds and finally a human pyramid. Overhead, Sukhoi fighter jets made a trishul, a trident in the sky. Each jet cost more than a billion rupees, four billion then for Shiva's trident. The thrilled crowd turned its face up to the weak winter sun and applauded. High in the sky, the winking silver sides of the jets carried the reflection of Rukmini's and Kamli's or Mehrunisa's and Shahbano's fight to the death. The army played the national anthem. The president drew the pallu of her sari over her head and took the salute. 
Thank you. Thank you.